Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on Australian red wines. I am Nick Jackson, Master of Wine, and we are happy to be joined once more by Mark Davidson. Mark, welcome. Hi Nick, nice to be back again. Super excited about the lineup today. Me too. Now, just by way of introduction, Mark is the Education Manager for Wine Australia in North America, looking after the US and Canada. Um, now, by way of introduction to this session, I will refer you to the previous video we did in this series on Australian white wines. Um, if you will find that video in this channel, in the School of Chase YouTube uh, channel. And in that video, the first seven or eight minutes, we talk about Australian wine in general, what you should be looking out for when you taste Australian wines. But because that applied both to white wines and to red wines, I propose not to cover that ground again. So just watch the first seven or eight minutes of that video and then you'll be ready for this one. So, Mark, I mean, if it works for you, then I suggest we just move on to uh, the first wine and we will sure. look out, I think, for two particular things as you queue up your slides. I will. Um, I just want to look at two things really today, which is first of all, to try and get a better understanding of these four varieties we're going to be looking at today, which is Pinot Noir, Grenache, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz in Australia, um, and do a sort of detailed uh, discussion analysis of the wines we're going to be tasting, which I think are going to be pretty good representations of those styles from Australia. And then I think um, sort of flowing out of that naturally will be a bit of a conversation about uh, trends and fashions and where we're at in Australian wine with those varieties and perhaps a bit more generally too. So, uh, Mark, do you want to just uh, take it from here for a second? Um, Will, I'm just going to, this also appeared in the white wine session. So if you've seen that one, you've seen this too, but it's also just a nice reminder. We've got a great free education resource with Australian Wine Discovered. Go look at it, use it, abuse it. Um, all sorts of programs in there, editable files, all free to access. Um, so good resource, a lot of the base information or certainly the base slides I'm, I'm using in this presentation, although today is not really about the presentation as much, have all been sourced from here. You need to sign up first time, but just get in there and get amongst it. But yes, um, so Pinot, uh, yeah, what's my little diatribe on Pinot? I think, <laughs> uh, I think the cool thing is that um, certainly back, when it would have been probably the mid 90s and I wasn't even living in Australia I was in Canada and I remember being a bit more excited about Pinots from Australia going okay cool probably not the first thing people think of when they think of Australian um, classic varieties yet it's a variety that's been in Australia since the Busby collection from what records will, will indicate so it's been a variety that's been there for a long time and I thought back in the 90s it would have been like oh wow I'm super excited about I think it was Coldstream Hills which sort of set a standard for what was going on with Pinot, um, at least in the export markets, because some of the really classic producers that maybe were famous before that, you weren't seeing them so much outside of Australia. But the reality is, I thought, wow, this one, this is delicious. This sits in there with, with what's going on in other parts of the new world with Pinot. But it was a bit of a hit and miss in those days, which I think you could probably have applied to a little bit to California, to Oregon. You're oh, careful what you pick. Um, and now it's just in this beautiful stage where knock yourself out, go experiment with any Pinot you can find in Australia. There's so much good stuff. And I think there's probably a trajectory in most new world countries that have attempted this variety, which is, oh, wow, it's difficult. <laughs> We've got to find the right clones. We've got to find the right sites. We've got to you know, then learn how to make it and manage it in, in a different way. And then you can start seeing the quality expanding. And I love that. And I think that's where we're at in Australia right now. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a I think you know MV6, which is Mother Vine 6, was the uh, the clipping that was sort of put aside as a variety as a, a cutting from uh, Pinot that came from probably Clovisio, but who cares? It's so, so long ago that it's adapted. But point is, it's been around for a long time, and that's the quote unquote clone that we would call a heritage clone, even though that's not really a term we use in Australia. But I think it's a good one. It, it, it's uh, it's apt in this case. And then those other clones started coming in, the classic sort of Dijon clones started coming in and other, various other things from different parts of the world started coming in in the 90s, um, going through quarantine and all the sorts of things they had to do. Um, and that's sort of changed the face of Pinot as well, but also made people go back and understand, hey, hang on a second, there's something inherently really cool about how MV6, MV6 has adapted to the Australian environment. And I think, so there's this sort of like, hey, we love these new Bur Burgundy clones, but this is an old clone that's technically Burgundian, but it's adapted to the environment in Australia. So you'll see MV6 in a lot of the 
um, Pinots are in and around about the place and some in this particular wine as well. Um, but I think it was finding those places, finding the right spots to, to sort of grow it um, and then learning how to make it, which is the, the key thing. And I think Yarra, first and foremost, has been, you know, it's known for all sorts of things, in, in, but it's become sort of Pinot, Pinot land in most people's minds. So, and I think Giant Steps, the uh, particular wine we're looking at here, I think has just been going from strength to strength. Interesting in that we mentioned this in the white wine um, discussion, they've been purchased by Jackson Family Wines, which I think is a wonderful thing because if you look at what Jackson's doing around about the place, they've got the properties in McLaren Vale, but everywhere they've gone to other parts of the world or other parts of the US, they pick up a great producer and work with it. And I'm excited about not not only the fact that they own it now, but the fact that they're, uh, you'll maybe hopefully be seeing more and more of their wines out on the market. So yeah, but this is it, uh, Applejack Vineyard, I'll go back, that's the shot of the vineyard. It does have Chardonnay in it, but gives you a little bit of a sense of where we're at. It's about 300 meters above sea level. And I like this shot because it shows the moodiness that is the Yarra Valley. It can be quite warm in the Yarra, but overall we are talking about a fairly cooler sort of climate there. Um, and I saw pictures that were from, um, they're just getting prior to harvest going on in um, parts of the Yarra, latter stage of the ripening. And I saw this video from someone that looked very much like this yesterday going on in the Yarra. And go, wow, you know, crazy summer, lots of rain, been cool, been hot, been everything. So yeah, it's been funny. But anyway, I think we now have a quick taste of this and uh, and see what you think. But yeah, let me just pick up on a couple of points. Um, the conversation about the clones, for many of you watching, talk about clones, not just, you know, a variety, like Pinot Noir is a variety. What, what, what's this whole deal about clones? You know, clones, different clones are the same variety. So yes, they're all still Pinot, but a different clone has got a slightly different makeup, which means that it's going to have a different final taste in the glass, but it can also grow a bit differently on the vine. And I remember, Mark, when I went uh, with you to the Yarra Valley um, back in 2015, we were with uh, another great producer of uh, Pinot Noir in the in the era uh, with Matt Forbes yeah. and he was uh, he was very very passionate about how much he believed in the MV6 clone he was saying yeah. of course everyone who makes Pinot Noir loves Burgundy that goes without saying and so they want to plant Dijon clones to try and replicate that style he said look there's no harm in having a little bit for, for seasoning perhaps you know, in your in your blend of clones, but really the MV6 is such a great clone for Australia and maybe especially for Yarra. Yeah, and he said he he said the um, I mean overall what you're getting in in, in Yarra is a, a cooler climate, but that doesn't mean that they're they're free from getting some of these hot sort of spells that can can happen in from vintage to vintage. And he said that's one of the among other things, one of the key characteristics he likes about MV6 is that um, he said. He finds the Burgundy, the Dijon clones, we call them the Barnard clones, the Bernard clones in, in, in Australia, but the Dijon clones, he said they're, he called them sooks. And by that means he means they're a bit wimpy under the hot weather, they kind of just fall over. And he said, and that's one of the things he first noted was that throughout the sort of vagaries of sort of warm to cooler climate, he found that the MV6, and, and that's just adaptability, because remember this was a Burgundian clone originally, it came from, reputedly came from Claude Bougeau, but because it's been there since the 1830s, <laughs> It's a right, right. adapted and that its origin to my mind is almost irrelevant given the sort of mutations that go on with varieties in general, but Pinot specifically, it's like, okay, so, so here's a variety that we had to go back and sort of go back and go, oh, hang on a second. Let's re remember this wine's been, this variety has been around a long time. Maybe we just haven't handled it in the vineyard properly and, and potentially in the winery. So yeah, you, it's, it's cool. It's a, it's a nice thing. And I like that. I like that we've got something that harkens back to Burgundy, but it's really not about Burgundy. It's just that that was the origin of the vines and, and the reality is it's, it's, you know, it's adapted. And I think that's kind of cool. Right. And yeah. I think in terms of, um, I mean, we should talk about the wine in front of us, but I mean, what impresses, us, I mean, I've had these wines many times, but they're, they're so silky in texture. Yeah. And really that's such a hard trick to pull off with, with Pinot Noir, especially in a warmer climate, you know, Mark, maybe you could say a bit more about the relative climate of Yarra, you know, compared to other growing regions of Victoria and in, in South Australia, generally what makes Yarra a good place for Pinot in climate terms? Um, it's, it, it depends where you are, because there are parts of Yarra where, you know, the original history with Yarra ended up being Cabernet, and that's the cool thing that you discover when you're down mm -hmm. there, because everyone talks Pinot, 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 or maybe Chardonnay, but Cabernet has a long history there, and, and I always view um, Yara, someone explained it to me this one. I like this because it was like, just think of it in three steps. 
because it's all little yeah. di different valleys, but you've got the valley floor, certainly better suited to, to, to a varieties that require warmer, um, warmer um, uh, areas. Um, but it's not overall really warm compared to, I'm trying to think of what would be a good comparison, even though climate is changing a bit. But then those middle sections, that middle section would, would traditionally have been the place where you'd harvest the varieties like Pinot and Chardonnay have always grown well there. And, but the, um, those middle, that sort of middle to upper slopes would be used for fizz because, oh, it's too cold up there. But things are changing. Right. So now those middle to upper Yarra Valley vineyard sites, that's the primo kind of viticultural land right now mm. because people want restraint they want to manage the, the the ripeness and that's how they're doing it and this at 300 meters you've got to remember 300 meters up from the valley floor that's point if it's on average 0. 0.6 degrees celsius overall temperature difference we're talking about close to two degrees of overall temperature difference at a vineyard like this versus the valley floor which i think is critical right. in, in an understanding of, of why peanut does well up here um and that i i'm with you on the silky thing because i'm in wine because of tasting a great burgundy back when I was, oh man, I was barely 23, 24. and remember going, what the hell is this? And right. I'd never had wine. I was just learning. I was like, why does, I actually feel something tasting this. I don't just, you know, intellectually like it. And, and I remember being struck by that and it took me a while to understand what it was, but aroma and texture. And that to me has always been the hallmark of what uh, defines good Pinot for me and makes me excited. And I think that's where we're starting to hit our stride. I think you see it in this particular wine, there's always gorgeous fruit, but if it's managed carefully, so it's not sort of big and over the top, you've just got this lovely, like you say, a beautiful silky um, texture with beautiful aromas, should be a bit on the floral side, but certainly with that lovely strawberry and sort of cherry uh, characters, character in there. And I'm Really thrilled. I really like where the winemaker has been taking these yeah. wines over the last couple of years. He's just gone from strength to strength and he's a chef by trade in the background. He actually was over in Burgundy in Beaujolais cooking and met a, a, a Barossa producer and just was who was Dean Hewitt and was working over there. And he said, I might become a, and I think there's something in the, the back, his background as a chef, I think is reflected in his wine. But I'm not quite sure what that character is, but anyway. Yeah, no, they're very, they're, they're such, to me, they're both kind of hedonistic wines in the way that, you know, Pinot can be such a hedonistic variety, but they're also precise and detailed. For the people watching at home who may not have tasted Yarra uh, Pinot very often, imagine something like, um, you know, in comparison with other non-European styles, it's certainly riper than New Zealand. It's riper than that really crisp clipped style. So it's got a bit more softness, but it's nowhere near the Californian level. You know, it's like somewhere uh, in the middle. I would argue it depends where you are in New Zealand, because certainly with Otago, I would argue that Yarra is probably would come across as a bit lighter and 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 more lifted than say Otago, because I think Otago is a bit of a, a bit of a tricky one, because I've, I've had some right. That's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's just some contra, but yeah, I think what what it is is that hey, that, you know, most of the good Pinot from Australia, well, all the good Pinot from Australia, it's coming from cool climates, managing and managing yes. the ripeness in in the warmer vintages when when they have to, and and I think people get a surprise because. You know, and you you visited, and <laughs> everyone thinks it's really hot in Australia. Well, except you know, where it isn't and when right. it isn't, because right. you know it can be quite cool. Right. Okay, we should we should move on, but just say one final word about other places to grow Pinot, you know, maybe in Victoria, somewhere like Mornington. What would be the what would be the difference climatically yeah. and the wise? I, I think, yeah, back to sort of identifying Yarra versus someone else. I actually would argue Yarra is quite difficult because in the same way that, I mean, I was tasting a bunch of Willamette Pinots recently and I feel like I understood it better 10 years ago than I do now. <laughs> so it's right. all over the place depending on style where right. uh, homogeneity of style I'm not a fan of, but having some sort of regional definition I think is cool. It's hard in Yarra to my mind. I think there's probably riper fruit in general, but the reality is that it depends on the vineyard sites. Mornington, I would argue, probably of all the Pinot producing areas in, in Australia, might just have this sort of homogenous in the very best sense of that word, this, this sort of line of sort of acid and, and tannin that I think is, 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 is kind of consistent along with, yeah, there's a lushness to the fruit, but it's not over the top. It's quite sort of, you know, it's quite contained and, and, and quite precise. So I think the difference, oh man, it, it's a tough one. Um, I would say there's a, a structure of tannins and, and, and acidity that are similar in, in Mornington throughout the wines than than, uh, than there would be in uh, Yarra, depending. You have light style Yarra, medium, yep. uh, you know, medium bodied uh, Yarra Pinot. Um, not I don't think you're a full bodied Pinot from Yarra. Yeah. So, but I thought this wine's just, just a delightful wine. Yeah. wine. And the emphasis on the silkiness, the texture, and the, and the, the floral perfume, mm -hmm. like you said, it's just it's a great it's a great combination. And I think also. 
I think this is true of anything. It's a funny variety in the sense that being as delicate as it is, oak does work with it, but you have to be cautious with the oak. And this is only 25% new. Um, it's in, in, I think it's in oak for about eight months. So I think right. that use of oak is a smart, has smartened up a little bit along with, you know, some whole bunch and some whole cluster of different things that are giving it a bit of poise and a bit of structure. But yeah, that's, um, that's ridiculously charming right now. It's a beautiful one. Um, but Giant Steps, everyone is a great is a great producer, and uh, at least in the US, relatively easy to find. I think probably easy to find in the UK as well. So a good one to go and seek out. Yeah, no, definitely a uh, definitely a, a, a readily available one. They've just changed um, ownership and importers here in the US. So it's owned by Jackson Family now, which is a, a I think a very positive thing. So there might be a bit of difference in terms of access to to um, the traditional. Um, uh, sources in the US, but it's it's going to come and come back really strong, which I think is, uh, I think is fantastic. But yeah, awesome. I haven't had wine Great. since the weekend, so maybe it's the first wine I've had that I'm just so excited oh. about. But I reckon that's showing. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. The <laughs> wine is pretty freaking good. Okay, so we will move uh, varieties now. I think uh, Giant Steps is just uh, such a great example of uh, not only uh, Yarra Valley, but also Australian Pinot you know, uh, in general and the potential for that style. But uh, Mark, why don't you tell us where we're going next? We're going to um, look at warm climate Pinot. <laughs> <laughs> warm we're going to go yeah. to, uh, we're going to try Grenache. We're gonna, that's a term used by the producers in the Barossa and I kind of don't mind it. We're going to go to McLaren Vale to a really cool producer. Down here, McLarenville being on the coast here, um, for those of you that aren't aware, but Oliver Stranger, I love it. The winemaker there on the left is uh, is um, is Corinna Wright. Sixth generation, a lot of the generations were grape growers just selling the fruit, which was very much a tradition in McLarenville. And then for the last couple of generations, they've had their own wines. They've been, you know, the source of some of the grapefruit that's every year gone into Grange and a few other um, few other classic wines. But now they're mostly doing doing their own kind of thing, and um, this Grenache, as you've heard me all too often, I think on my trip, I was probably beating the Grenache drum before the participants before we even got down to McLaren Vale and certainly in other places. But I've, I feel like McLaren Vale has led the charge of looking at this variety very differently. And you're seeing examples of this in other parts of the world, in Spain and, and France, just going, hang on a second, this doesn't have to be this big, full-bodied, concentrated, potentially a bit overripe sort of um, a massive sort of not massive but you know alcoholic and blousy sort of a wine there are other sides to Grenache if you pick it a bit early use a little whole cluster perhaps even looking at it a bit like Pinot I think um, and virtually in my opinion this is just opinion right here not fact I don't like new oak with Grenache it seems to stick out and I'm not 100% why that is the case um, but it's just one of those varieties that benefits from the wood, but the oxidative nature of being in wood as opposed to sort of picking up just the, the flavor profile. So I think what Grenache, what's happened with Grenache and McLaren Vale is just, wow, You instead of looking at it from a narrow kind of viewpoint of like, oh, Grenache is this, I think we're sort of seeing this sort of wider sort of tapestry of character and, and quality and flavor that um, I think it's really exciting and and maybe even, you know, for, for many reasons, better with the climate and, and what the, you know, what you're eating and drinking and and, and um, how you're living down in McLaren, which I think is a really kind of interesting way to look at it as well. But yeah, Oliver's trying to not just come back into the US. It's nice to see them in the US again. Um, they've probably been in the UK for quite some time, but it's nice to sort of see what they're doing because um, I think they've always been for a traditional family, six generations of grape growing. She planted Fiano about 12 or 15 years ago. Uh, one of the first varietal menthias I ever had was from Oliver's Taranga. And it's like, okay, so there's some innovation at, this, at the heart of this, not just tradition. All of this, um, all of this talk reminds me, you know, that Grenache is an elementally Mediterranean variety. And um, this is a relatively Mediterranean climate, albeit perhaps a bit warmer at times down there. But um, certainly, you know, that, kind of dustiness that Grenache seems to love comes across in the wines very very well but like you said I think Grenache is a, is a variety in transformation across the world uh, you know the old uh, syrupy Chateauneuf you know it's not so popular anymore but the transparent style I, I guess if I wanted someone to know something about Australian Grenache it would be that they're going for that more transparent almost translucent style where you can pick up all the flavors very very uh, precisely yeah, and I think that's it's a it's a function of um, harvest times and like picking a bit earlier and not you know you can't have it underripe but it's about you know being overripe which is very easy to do and and I always think back to what 
you know, what Grenache based or, you know, 100% Grenache or Grenache based wines. What is it we don't like about bad Grenache? It's that candied, soft, syrupy yeah. quality. The richness and ripeness is a lovely thing, um, but not to to the exclusion of some precision with some structure and what have you. And I think, you know, Grenache, when done well, has that. I think this wine falls right between the sort of classic style and, and the sort of a new style. There is that perfumed, um, dusty, I, almost, I always think it's a white pepper kind of a lift that you get mm. from good Grenache. Uh, but there's a structure, there's a structure of tannins that I love in, in, in uh, McLaren Vale Grenache, no matter what style is being, um, being produced, there's just this grippiness to the tannins that just give a certain firmness without being harsh. You sort of, it's almost just like a, a, a flicker of like, oh, wow, there's some, some little structural elements in there, in around all the gorgeous fruit and there's the, the beautiful aromatics. And I think that's kind of what I look for. But I think, yeah, the old... Um, style of Grenache is definitely harder and harder to find. And I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. I just think that that more ethereal lifted sort of perfumed quality that Grenache we now know is capable of, of um, showing, it's it's great to see it. And it kind of, I mean, a lot of people you speak to and especially McLaren Vale, even though he didn't live there and Taris you met, and unfortunately he passed away um, late last year. He was a guy that most people look looked to and said, wow, you made me brave to look at Grenache and go, oh, wow, you've really pushed it back here to picking quite early. And and, and I think that's a nice uh, a nice testament to sort of people, you know, moving in a different direction. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a fascinating wine. And I, you have this uh, you have this one liner about uh, Pinot and Grenache and how to perceive them. Maybe you would uh, share that with our audience. Um, yeah, I think there's. I think there's some. I think there's more similarities between these two. Strangely, because when I first heard about this, uh, you know, all oh, warm climate Pinot, I thought oh, that's kind of annoying. But it's like, well, actually, when you think about it, thin-skinned. Both are thin-skinned varieties. Both are, yep. are not very pigmented. Pigmented. Yep. Now I look at Grenache, and if it's deep, dark, and concentrated, I'm going, okay, what the hell's going wrong with this one? <laughs> As I do with Pinot, to be honest. But I feel like there's um. Yeah, the character to my mind in, in Grenache is you're going to have more body. It's just for the most part, you can have more body, generally a little bit more alcohol, but not necessarily um, overt anymore. Um, but there's just a gorgeous sort of seductiveness to the to, to both of those varieties that I think, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, weirdly, it's not ever something in my early days of learning about what that Grenache and Pina, what the hell are you talking about? Right. But there is there's a correspondence. I think there's a bit of a correspondence. I don't know if there was a particular line I used that captured your attention at some point, but I can't remember what it is. It was a <laughs> line about uh, uh, Grenache delivers what Pinot promises. <laughs> no, I'll, I'm not sure if I 100% agree with that because I make, because I have a, my. You're just stirring a pot when you say that. <laughs> my first. <laughs> My first love was Pinot Noir, and I make excuses for shitty Pinot Noir all the time because it was my first love. But um, I think there is a certain element of maybe that's a, a, a statement of consistency in the sense that Grenache is a beautifully suited variety to many climates in Australia, the warmer climates, and um, there is seductiveness there and perhaps a more consistent nature to 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 the, the character and quality of modern Grenache coming out of Australia now than perhaps Pinot in general. But it's a harsh line. I can't believe I used that and I can't believe you remembered it. <laughs> no, it's, ne it's never been repeated by anyone, less, let, let alone by you, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, but let me, let's just wrap up Grenache with this one uh, observation that I, I believe, tell me if this is wrong, but still in Australia, only 1% of uh, vineyards apply to two. Grenache, but I feel like um, the uh, attention going to Grenache now is way more than that. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a little bit high, but you're right, it's not high. I, if it was above three or four percent, I thought I thought the more 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 recent stats were showing something else. But no, it, it's it's you're absolutely right. It's um it probably you know the 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 um vineyard area for Grenache, given what it used to be and how much got pulled out, which is a shame. Um, it was a variety that was really well suited to the climate in Australia. And I think what we might be seeing is a, a is a you know a few more plantings, and um, I think that is already happening in in mass on mass, not so much. But it's nice to, to to look at this and go, wow, this was one of the benchmark, well not benchmark, this was one of the workhorse varieties in Australia for a while, and then a lot got pulled out, which is kind of a shame. And it's getting abnormal coverage given how much is in the ground. And I I think it's just this. Right. Um, I think there's a couple of things going on. It's it's based in Australia too, I think, because the way people are drinking, I think people in around the world generally are drinking. They like lighter style wines, and I, you know, my theory about lighter reds is always, you know, when you drink wine every day, 
you want something that's got a bit of lift and a bit of lightness. A big full-bodied wine's delicious, wonderful. We love them from time to time. I don't want them every day though. So I think there's a bit of that going on, and sure. um, and I think that uh, I think the spectrum with which you can capture different characters and what have you with Grenache and, and different sort of body and weight, I think that's a, a really appealing appealing thing. So yeah, I, I think it does get abnormal amount of press. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, put it in front of people. I mean, I was doing, I was just talking to someone at the gym the other day, a guy I know at the gym and we, it was Christmas time and I gave him a bottle of, of a Grenache and he's not even, him and his wife drink wine or whatever. And every time I've done this with this particular one, it was one of Tara Sokota's wines. Everyone's like, that's so delicious. We, but wow, it disappeared really quick. And that's always a measure for me, of you know, the, the deliciousness factor. And I think that's, you know, the, it's the style is appealing. It, it's light, but without being, sort of wimpy and kind of like, oh, there's nothing much to it. There's always something sort of, you know, structured and characterful, so. Fantastic. Okay, wine students, do not quote me about the 1% line. That is not correct, but there's still uh, <laughs> Grenache. I, I'll have to uh, look at that. It's not, it's, not it's not much above that. You're absolutely right. I would have thought maybe, I thought the number of 4% sticks in my mind, but I'd be <laughs> shocked if it's above that. And that's, that's right. it, the point is that for the amount of, that we talk about it and for, for its, history and, and heritage in Australia, actually we could do with some, we could do with some more. And I know some people, I know there's an MS from um, uh, the US who's now living in Amsterdam, Richard Betts, who's got his Suzette program there. He bought a beautiful old vineyard in Barossa after traveling everywhere where Grenache is grown. He, he settled on buying property in the Barossa. He's replanting, but he's doing old school. He's planting bush vines. He's, uh, and all oh, the old so growers in Barossa are like, hey, don't know who you are. We thought you were a bit of a knob coming in here as an American doing this, but you're doing it right, which is kind of cool. I, I, that's awesome. That's, that earns everyone's respect. Okay, totally. so next we are going to go to our third variety. Um, and why don't you go off? Uh, what are we What are we dealing with here? Yeah, we're looking at Kunawara, and we're, we're doing two. We're going to do two wines here. We're going to do Margaret River and Kunawara because honestly, they're the two. I would argue that you know, the, it's the great Cabernet grown in many areas in Australia, and I don't want to shortchange some of the other areas where it's grown. But if you, when push comes to shove, the two most famous areas for for Cabernet in in Australia right now, in terms of um, character quality and also availability, the, the, it's Kunawara number one and and Margaret River number two, or number one and number two. You could switch. Um, and I would also strongly suggest that there are, you know, for varietal Cabernet Sauvignon, and I've misspelt it on my slide, I cannot believe that. Um, for varietal it's, a, Cab it's a new variety specialist to Australia. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to buy it, you can just rent it. Um, <laughs> but um, I think there's an extremely strong argument for if you want, you know, regionally expressive, classic Cabernet Sauvignon, not necessarily 100% varietal, but sort of, you know, mostly, mostly Cabernet, because sometimes these wines have a bit of other... Uh, varieties blended into them. I, if you, you're hard pressed to beat what's going on at Kunawara and Margaret River right now. Yes, there are expensive wines, but an expensive top of the line Margaret River cab would be $140. I mean, let's talk Napa, let's talk Bordeaux. <laughs> you know, it's like, so what, right. what we're looking at is incredible value. But here's a, just a couple of quick things because we'll get into tasting the wines and it might not be a bad idea to sort of almost go back and forth here. But uh, the key characteristic about Kunawara is that uh, where it's situated, which is down here on the coast, way down, sorry, inland, it's on in the limestone coast, it's inland, but it is affected. And I'll show you why that is strangely an, a, an effect of the cooling breezes in the ocean. Terra Rossa soils, one of the few soils people will always go, yeah, I, I know an Australian wine soil, it's Kunawara's Terra Rossa soils. <laughs> it's well known and well discussed and well done Kunawara um, uh, because it's you know it's pretty much around the world. You ask that question, people know exactly the soils of Kunawara. Um, and this is the interesting element, and I've not been in Kunawara and experienced this, but right around March, April, like the latter half of the growing season, depending on obviously the season, there's this upwelling of what's called the Bonnie current. And you can see by the graph here, it may not be 100% clear, but you can look at the dark nature, the darker the blue here, the, the colder the water. So we are talking about cold water, colder than Southern Tasmania, just with this weird upwelling sitting off the limestone coast here. And the growers always talk about it, saying, ah, yeah, it's here, because you can feel it in the air, there's something. And then that's a, a, a beautiful thing, because it prolongs it, cools down the overall temperature, even if it's sunny and there's been a warm season, you'll end up, it ends up cooling down the overall temperature in that, that latter half of the ripening, gives you a better hang time, which is where I think that density and concentration of, of and vibrancy of the fruit comes through in, in uh, Kunawara. So uh, we'll have a quick look at that, because I think the comparisons of these two, I think these wines showed when I taste them earlier, because 
and I'm always, you know, you, always, you want wines to behave and show what you want them to show and in, in, in terms of classic sort of uh, expression. But Yeah, I mean, Cabernet is definitely one of those varieties where if you can have a cooler end to the growing season rather than just persisting at the same heat of the summer, it's such a huge advantage because those flavors can just develop gradually and create complexity. Yeah, this is cool. I love um, the winemaker here is Kate Goodman and she's taken, well, it was a great estate, there's no question, but I feel like she's taken it to a different level in terms of a purity of fruit and, and, and character. I really like that. That to me is a bloody good example of textbook Kunawara Cab. And tell me what you think first, then I'll tell you why I think this is a good, a good, a good example of Kunawara. Well, what I noticed about it is the fruit is concentrated clearly. Uh, it's quite compact and tight. Um, this one is not uh, an unduly tannic uh, example. I'm sure you could find more uh, others which are more tannic, but the tannins that are there are ripe uh, and supple and definitely coated in the fruit. And then I love the kind of um, that kind of dusty, warm, sort of dusty quality uh, to the wine overall. Like it's such a it gets such an interesting note beyond just just the fruit and it also contributes a, an element of dryness to to the wine mm. as well it is quite a dry style of australian wine yeah it is and i think the character i like in this is um i've always it i think it's been hard for me in the historical is okay what's the characteristic of 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 kunawara cab versus i don't know somewhere else um and so between margaret river and kunawara and versus you know i don't know napa or whatever i think um what you get here is there's a density and concentration of fruit there's a different fruit quality to this and then then i say margaret river i'm going to try margaret river in a moment but there's a concentration and density you you even said that there's that yeah it's ripe but it's not overripe there's a purity there at the same time there's a whiff of mint which i thought was kind of appealing in here i think we've yeah. been beaten into submission and forgotten that cabernet actually can and should have a little bit of herbal lift and we'll see it more more prominently in the next wine but i think that tannin quality combined with that density of fruit because i actually think the the tannins are a bit more grippy and persistent than initially showed but that co concentration and density of fruit without being overripe i think is part of that sort of compact picture that that um always leads me towards quinoa and i always get strangely and i'm a little bit less so in here not sure why i say this but there's a smell to me, and I never, it's the only wine I ever apply what I would normally apply to white wines. And it's like a strong honey. <laughs> I know that's bizarre and everyone, but that's always been my marker for, for my own sort of blind tasting is that, wow, I get this weird sort of almost um, eucalyptus honey quality. It's not just eucalyptus. Do you know what I mean? I, maybe yeah. it's just. It's, yeah, there is something of that. Yeah, I know what you mean of that, of that character. It's hard to describe it. But if you um, make really good honey, and you, you know, open the jar and have a smell. There's this sort of yeah. It's not just oh, it's like you know whatever. But there was a character in there. Anyway, that's my my own little quirk there for sure. But there's almost a, a sort of savory umami, slightly soy quality at the finish of this wine. And maybe soy is the wrong uh, wrong um, wrong uh, descriptor. But I think to my mind, the identification, the key identification thing is that depth and and, and concentration of color, but also that depth and concentration of fruit without being overripe. Um, whereas in Napa, and of course, all things being equal, which they never are, but I mean, if I look at you know classic Napa nowadays, I would argue softer tannins and slightly riper fruit. Absolutely, yeah. This is not by any means voluptuous or luxurious no. or excessive. It's very tight. Everything mm. about it, the fruit is tight, the tannins are tight. And yeah, sure, it's a, a young wine that will, you know, everything will relax with age, but the, the style is quite tight-knit, quite classical almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, lovely. Oh, wow. I, I, I must admit, Mark, I didn't know this uh, producer before um, this uh, session, and this is not uh, an expensive wine, but it's super delicious. Yeah, I think it's 30 something dollars. Maybe it's 35. I can't think. Maybe it's a little bit more than that, but it's not mo above that. And this is, again, and honestly, there's one half of me that doing the work I've been doing with Wine Australia and getting people to look at Australian wines and maybe spend more money on the good stuff. I love that Napa has managed to get people to just fork over a hundred dollars at the drop of a hat. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. It's so smart and we've not done a good job of that. But with that in mind, you look at this and go, wow, if you love Cabernet, um, that has a bit of structure, a bit more sort of classically styled, 
that is ridiculous value because I can't even think of a, a Napa Appalachian cab for thirty or forty dollars that has that character or quality. In fact, I'm struggling to even think. I'm sure there are some now because prices did come down a little bit. Um, but when does you know, in your opinion, where does Napa Valley cab become interesting price point wise? I mean, I think in fifty US dollars minimum. Minimum, um, yeah. You'd be lucky. And they, <laughs> Yeah, 60 to 80 more realistically. Probably, but I mean, yeah. I think probably the you know the most famous wine that comes out of Kunawara is Wynn's Black Label. No question. And that is another wine which is not expensive. So I'm talking about probably 40 US dollars, something like that. And that is a 25 yeah. year wine. Yeah, it is. It's it's brilliant stuff. And actually the, the wine that I wanted to get a slightly better um, like step up from there, but their regular bottling of the Cabernet, their Phoenix Cabernet is 18.95 in the US. And it's like, yeah, everything you want from delicious Cabernet right. is in that right. bottle and it's under $20. And that's just a remarkable thing that I need, needs to be sung from the rooftops, not just because I work for Australia, uh, but it's just like, hey, you want you want to drink delicious Cabernet? Have a look at Kunawara. There's some damn good stuff there. So, And let me just yeah. highlight, we'll move on to the Margaret River now, but let me just highlight one thing, you know, very obvious thing, but this is a dry wine. If you're someone that likes dry <laughs> Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon is, a, is an elementally dry variety, I believe. Um, it doesn't always come out like that in, from certain places, but this is a dry wine and I love that. It makes it so food friendly as well. Yeah, it's, it isn't it funny that we have to say that nowadays, but you're absolutely right. It's right. such a good comment. It's such a good comment. Cool. Uh, Margaret River, over onto the other side of the country um, into, uh, um, and with the, the, one of the founding, really one of the first wineries ever set up in Margaret River. Um, was Vast Felix in 1967. So it's a pioneer winery and I've always been a fan. I've always liked what they've done. Then Virginia Wilcock took over in probably 2005, 2006. And if you've met her, you immediately fall in love with her. She's a character, she's brilliant, she's smart, and she's taken great winery to even greater heights in my humble opinion. Uh, but this particular wine, they have an entry level cab called Phileas, then they have this. Then they have the top wine now called the Tom Cullity. Um, which, yeah, the 2014 version of that might have been the 15, might be one of the great Cabernet-based wines I've ever had coming out of Australia, period. It's that good. Wow. But this, to my mind, is right in the middle where it's like, this is what you want from Margaret River. So have a sniff and a whiff of this, and I'll talk a bit about Margaret River. On the coast, so this was initially in a region where um, – uh, a doctor in the 60s that was sort of commissioned to sort of assess the viticultural potential, a guy called John Glasner. He came back with Bordeaux comparisons, gravelly soils, maritime climate, but sort of w slightly warmer than Bordeaux, like Bordeaux in a warm vintage, actually. And that's just a, a kind of a look at it. There's that sort of, you know, gravelly loam over heavy gravel loam and then clay at the bottom. That's fairly classic soils for, for where Cabernet is being grown in Margaret River. It's different in other places. And you can kind of see where in this middle section of the of Margaret River, that seems to be classic Kuno, uh, sorry, Cabernet country uh, and, uh, and going further north. Further south gets a bit cooler and that Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon and a bit of Chardonnay down there. But this middle section seems to be the hotbed. But kind of a quite a, not, not stark, but there's quite a difference between these two wines. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. Um, and, th and this is the moment I wish that, you know, YouTube had some kind of a smell function because it's just a beautifully aromatic style of Cabernet. Um, we don't necessarily think of Cabernet as being an aromatic red variety, not like Pinot or maybe Syrah or something like that. But I mean, this just is, uh, I, you know, someone once gave me this note for the Margaret River Cabernet of warm bricks, which is, it sounds fanciful, but once you understand what they're getting at, it really does come through quite often. Yeah, I actually, oh, I can't, I mean, it's, you know, I, you know, I'm supposed to love all wines equally from Australia, my job, but I <laughs> love Margaret River, man. I love it. Yeah. I love the Cabernets coming out of here. I will happily put them on. I'm a big Bordeaux fan. I love great Cabernet from all, I love great Napa. Can't afford the stuff I like because it's usually up on the mountains, but I love Cabernet. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's just one of my favorite varieties, but what Margaret River is, is expressing, and this is absolutely the epitome of what I love about it, is that we've forgotten that Cabernet can be aromatic. And I believe it's that slight herbal lift that gives it that character and quality, but there's also floral in there. Um, there's a, there is that violety sort of slightly floral quality. And I like the warm brick one because mine's always been very clumsy because I remember smelling a good, oh gosh, like a 
dusty road that's just been rained on, which of course is yeah. not be dusty anymore, but you know that smell is that <laughs> sort of warm kind of you know it's been hot. Like and warm it, baking spices as well. Totally, yeah. But this is a beautiful, beautiful wine. And again, this I think this is maybe in the 50s or something in this the mid range. But um, yeah. this is looking particularly good today and I, I you know and like you say that that lift that lovely aromatic with just that whiff of herbal quality but not it's not this green stem it's not a green wine leaf. folks it's not it's not a green wine it's just a little just the tiniest hint of something her, her, herbal uh, I don't even want to say herbaceous but just something herbal and but to me on the palate mark the main difference here from Kunawara is that this, the wine seems to be a bit more relaxed for want of a better word yeah, it's a good. That's a really brilliant expression because that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, um, the Kunawara is more taut. Yeah, yes, that's absolutely right. It's this one's a little bit more open and expressive, and that's interesting because it's a year younger, isn't it? Oh, what's the Penley? No, my apologies. What's the Penley? No, no, the Penley's younger. Uh, Penley's a year younger. Sorry, I thought it was sixteen, but it's eighteen. Um, yeah, it is. It is a bit more open and relaxed. I think it's just that aromatic thing. I think that that there's a there's a yeah, there is a bit of an openness there. It's a really interesting way of looking at it. I never would have used that expression, but I think you're you're right, chasing these. I side guess by what side. I'm what I'm sort of trying to get at is the yeah. this idea I often think about with Margaret River, also true in the shards, by the way. It, the wines from here seem to come out very naturally. They're very unforced. You know, yeah, it's almost I, as if they just run off the vat like this. <laughs> Yeah, that, I feel like there's just this purity and clarity in, in my river, and you can apply this to all sorts of areas, but I think it, this is power suggestion. This is absolutely zero scientific fact coming here. This is just what I feel like. You stand here on the on the Pacific, on the the Indian Ocean, right? You look out to where the, all the prevailing winds are coming from, all the systems are coming across, and it's like no bodies of land. It's like thousands of miles and you'll get to South Africa or miss it and just circle around the southern part of the globe in the ocean. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like there's there's a purity of the rain that come the water that comes through there, the air. And I, I feel like that that is reflected and there's zero scientific that's just sort of romanticism there on my part part and I fully admit that. But there is a purity to the wines here, which maybe is maybe we're talking about the same same sort of a thing here. But I um yeah I'm super excited about that wine. I think that wine looks absolutely delicious and and I would happily put that in front of just you know anyone that's a Cabernet lover and go okay here's this is let's remind ourselves how Cabernet can be which is I wouldn't even call this full bodied I'd call it medium to full bodied yeah. and just perfumed and aromatic and yeah and I I was lucky in that when I got into being a young someone that got into to wine in the 80s Bordeaux was a bit different yes 82 changed a, a, a lot of things but Bordeaux still was a bit more restrained than it potentially is right now. And I know you're a big Bordeaux fan and you'll probably agree with me, but Bordeaux, I grew up on more classically framed Bordeaux, if you like. Um, grew up on them, so make it sound like I drank first growth every day. That wasn't the case. But the point is, you know, I think the style has evolved and it's probably a function of the market, but also of climate. And this reminds me of more sort of classically styled Cabernet. And that's why I love it. Yeah. I, I, I'm just trying to, let me just try and explain what it tastes like, obviously, to people who are, who are not tasting it at home. It's simply, um, if you're one of those people who doesn't like Cabernet, because basically it's a chore to drink it, it's hard work, there's too much tannin, there's too much fruit, it's a bit one-dimensional, then here is the complete opposite. It's, it's just so easy, it just flows naturally, uh, it's just pure pleasure every inch of it. Yeah, it uh, it really is. It really is. I think that's a lovely way of uh, of describing it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've always okay, loved the wine. So that, that shows. That shows. That shows pretty good. <laughs> it, sh it shows great, and you know what's also great is the fact that these two wines, I think, show such different characters. You know, the compact, tight, focused Kunawara with those firm tannins, and then on the other hand, the, the yeah. much more relaxed but also refined and classy Margaret River. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's cool. Yeah, I think that would be the differentiating points uh, between these two. I guess there's also that thing that, you know, with having been in the MW program as well, I think if you get to the point where you know it's Australia and you're thinking between Coonawarra and Margaret River, it's only a point or so <laughs> figuring out the difference. But I think the two things, just what you said there, that that openness and that lift um, versus that sort of maybe that density and, and, and concentration of tannins and, and sort of you know, slightly firm, sorry, concentration of fruit and slightly firmer tannins sort of like it's almost like those tannins like you said 
it's not relaxed because it's like it's holding it's holding that fruit in in a, in a way so that might be the way to, to sort of distinguish the two yeah, beautiful stuff though wow it's it's uh absolutely i'm really yeah. happy with both of those and, and i'm particularly happy with penley because i've always liked the estate and i've always been impressed with them but it's just you can see what's happening with just a little bit of work in the vineyard and a little bit of work in the in the winery where there's a purity uh in these more recent vintages and it's nice to taste it yeah because the last time i had this was a 16 which i think Kate just blended, so these, the last couple of vintages have been all hers. And wow, you can see her hand in here; it's lovely. No, I'm, I'm, and for me, I'm just so happy to discover a, a producer I didn't know before. So that's and it's kind of cool. Idea. This I just struck me right now. The last three wines we looked at have been all women winemakers. Not that that's a testament for anything, but isn't it funny that Cabernet Sauvignon, a real blokey wine, which is a very sexist comment, is not being the the two we're looking at here are not being made by women, <laughs> not being made by yeah. men. Kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, delicious wines. Okay, so we will move on to our final uh, variety, but we have two wines representing. Uh, and of course, this being an Australian red wine session, we couldn't not talk uh, about uh, Shiraz, Syrah. So Mark, take it away. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to look at this. So you can't not discuss Barossa, but I think what we've got, um, we could, so we'll do the Barossa last, but I mean, just maybe because I think people, for the most part, outside of Australia, I think it's fair to say that if you think, of, never mind Shiraz, if you think Australian wine, quite often Barossa is the region that people go to, and that's quite often Shiraz. And certainly, um, with good reason, there's more of it that's been exported, and it's been it's kind of one of our most historic and and um, and storied regions. Uh, with you know the oldest Shiraz vines on the in the world exist there, um, Grenache as as well, Mourvedre as well. But the reality is that um, I think, in fairness, I think Barossa has been tarred. Maybe it maybe it got this 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 thing for a reason, but the reality is that um, where Barossa sits right now is vastly different from people's impression of of how Barossa was even 10 or 12 years ago. And that is, it's all big, it's all alcoholic, it's all really really oaky um, and quite concentrated. It's like, well, those wines still exist, but there's a whole other side of Barossa, or a whole you know a complexity to Barossa through a lot of work that's been going on in the vineyard, the different attitudes and, and making the wines more of a more, sort of more approachable and not so so uh, dense and concentrated, I think has really happened. Hopefully that's gonna show through in the wine there. Um, but I wanted to, you know, somehow show that if you look at, here's the biggest problem we've got is that the term Australian Shiraz is a problematic one in the sense that we use it. It's part of wine vernacular globally, but you don't ever say French Pinot or American Cabernet but we're, yet, we're still talking as a nation, we're talking about a variety as opposed to regional expressions. Well, you know, And that's where the problem lies in that it's grown in virtually every region in Australia. In fact, I think every region grows some Shiraz to a greater or lesser degree and to with greater or lesser success. But how can you, with all the different climates, different sorts, how can it all be the same? How can Australian Shiraz look the same? At a commercial level, at a supermarket, mass market level, yeah, absolutely, there's a style that people have known and become fond of, but when you start getting into the intricacies and what this variety is capable of expressing, um, you know, across our landscape in Australia, there's no other country that can do with this variety what we can do with it. And we can't show that in two wines, but I wanted to show a benchmark wine that completely and utterly rocked my world years ago when I first tried it. It's done that to a lot of people. I know that for a fact. Um, and that's why I, I selected went down to Canberra district to, to, to this particular producer, Clonakilla Shiraz, Viognier. Um, so let's have a look at it. But what we're looking at here is a, a region that's, it's, I mean, it's hard to say that Canberra District is cool climate. It's certainly not hot climate. It's more moderate climate. It, it certainly gets warm during the, the growing season, but it's it's more continental climate. So you're getting cooler evenings. And I think that's a, that, I mean, I think that's a, a, a really important piece of the puzzle as well. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant story. And um, my story with it was I read something. I was living in I was living in Canada, I think, at the time. And I was visiting Australia. I remember reading this article from Jancis going, well, benchmark for for sort of, you know, cooler climate expression of Australian Shiraz. I'm like, I've never even heard of it. Like, what have I been doing? I haven't been paying attention. This is before I was doing the job I was doing now. I'm doing now. Looked for, I was like, wow, I'm going to try and find this. Couldn't find anywhere in Australia and found someone I got to the US. And I remember having it side by side with a... Um, uh, Jasmine Cote Roti, and totally different, but absolutely belonged on the same table in terms of the the ability of wine. And I remember first trying Cote Roti and being like good Cote Roti going, oh, wow, this is almost Burgundian in a weird sort of a way in the sense that um, it, it, you know, it, it inspired an emotional response, but it also was one of those amazing wines 
that can walk this tightrope of power and intensity and perfume and elegance. And I think that is incredibly difficult to do and incredibly charming. And it's the kind of things that get me out of bed every day. Um, but Clonakilla does that. And, uh, and I know that when people taste it, they go like, what the heck is going on here? There's beautiful perfume, beautiful aromatics. And it's just one of those benchmark variety, a benchmark wine producers now that really has only been in, around since the 70s. However, only became really famous in the 90s, which is kind of short in, in the, the grand scheme of things. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'll ever get a better example of a wine that will blow away all those stereotypes about what you think Australian Shiraz is than, than Quanakilla. And this is the sort of higher end uh, example. And you can get there's, uh, you know, far less expensive uh, Shiraz from this estate. And if any of you have never tasted Quanakilla, then you, you owe it to yourself before you pass any judgment on what Australian Shiraz is, because this is such a, a wonderful and unique uh, producer. Tim Kirk is the name of the, the guy, and uh, he, you know, this is a person who uh, was close to becoming a Catholic monk, you know, and he felt that his calling from God was to go and make wine instead, and he did, and he made uh, and continues to make incredible, complex uh, Shiraz wines. Now, Mark, let me tell you, let me tell you this. So, of course, I couldn't uh, resist. I had to open this last night to have a, a first look at it, and you know, I was I was sat there tasting, and I was thinking to myself. This is crazy that this is Shiraz and it's so silky and elegant and uh, aromatic. And I was trying to come up with analogues in my mind because I was thinking about all those brawny northern Rhone ones from Hermitage and Crow's Hermitage and San Joseph. And then I was thinking about California where they're much bigger again. And I was thinking about, of course, uh, you know, Barossa. Say. But I did miss this one appellation in the northern Rhone, which you've already mentioned, which is Cote Roti. And Cote Roti and Clonicola are your reminders that Syrah does not have to be a full-bodied, alcoholic, big, tannic wine. It doesn't have to be. And in fact, this is continuing along this theme of the Pinot, the Grenache. This is another silky, precise, expressive wine from Australia. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm, I'm jealous. I probably should have done the same thing. Should I open it last night? Um, I was technically not drinking until today, so I had the week off, but <laughs> but it's, um, I bet you it's showing amazing perfume now, having been open for a, for a day. Again, um, you know, one of my benchmarks, I always, you know, wine 101 is that European wine is savory and wine from outside Europe often is fruitier or sometimes sweeter tasting. But, you know, here again, we're in the presence of quite a dry example. <laughs> of a non-European wine, really. It's, and there is savoury, and I, I, I remember asking a few producers, because one thing that I think is an important thing to note as well, um, and Tim's Tim Kirk has, has increased this too, post-fermentation maceration with Shiraz has changed dramatically. It used to be six, eight, 10 days or whatever in a classic Barossa. Tim is 30 to 40 days. I don't remember what this is now, but it's always higher than you might imagine. And there's other producers playing with that. And I remember asking a few of them saying, God, oh, is that where this umami thing comes from? Because mm, mm. I, I wonder if it is because, you, you know, as a rem reminder, I think when you're young and sort of learning about it, you taste Barolo and these long maceration times and you realize that, oh, that's because that's because it's so extractive. But actually, it's the reverse. That's not what long maceration does. It's quite, it's polymerization of tannins. It's about softening them. And I think there's a savoriness that takes away some of the overt fruit quality. And this is all, again, you know, I, there's no scientific fact to this, but I've asked a lot of producers and they go, yeah, maybe that's the response, but you're spot on with that, that, there's that savory umami quality, which I think is that to me is charming because that's the Moorish quality <laughs> to use an English expression. You want to go back and have more of this. Um, and that is, um, yeah, dry, finishes dry, finishes savory, makes you want to eat more and drink more. But on the flip side of that, what is balancing that out is in this absolutely amazing photo we can see on the slide is the presence of the the onion, uh, which of course always gives this slightly sweet, um, almost just a touch of uh, kind of viscous texture as well. It is exactly uh, what they're looking for. Cause, yeah, because people were saying this is what I, I found when I visited Cote Roti because you, you, you're looking for the Viognier as a young geeky sommelier. You're looking for the the Viognier in there. And I remember trying with, it was at Gigal and a couple other producers. And I remember trying Syrah with no 
Viognier, and yet there's a corresponding aromatic in cooler climate Syrah as there is in the Viognier. There's a violety floral thing that I think comes out, and sometimes it was not with wines that didn't have any Viognier now. So I think that's an interesting piece of the puzzle. But yeah, that aromatic lift that I think brings the Viognier brings it, but it's it's almost like it, the Viognier is bringing the aromatic lift out of the floral notes out of the Syrah at the same time. But they always talk exactly what you talk about texture. They talk about the slippery texture in Australia. There's something to do with, and I'm not scientifically savvy enough to explain it, but it's to do with the, with something to do with catechins and a whole bunch of other sort of chemical reactions that go on. But it's about textural difference, and and it does give you that. It's just incredibly silky, and I think that's there's no better term than silky. It's it's perfect. Yeah. And just to give people an idea of what this wine smells and tastes like, I mean. You know, it's all the things that we associate with really with the Northern Road, you know, the smoky bacon and the violets, like you said. Um, almost like a, a charred, smoky quality on the nose. And certainly not from oak or anything like that, but just the elemental sort of meatiness of the wine. Yeah, that's the, that's Shiraz. That's cooler climate grown, grown Shiraz. And also when uh, the, um, AWRI loca uh, isolated what the compound, the rotundone was, which is in black pepper, once they located what that was that was giving cooler climate Syrah that. This was one of the vineyard sites they used because on the cooler vineyards, especially Rotundo was quite prominent in this particular wine, Matt Lange and a couple of others. And there is that peppery note in the background, uh, and which, which is which is they, they've noted uh, through research that that's cooler climate grown Shiraz, Syrah, call it what you want. Um, that's where Rotundo starts to, to, to sort of peek through. But yeah, and I love it too because they always talk about the percentage. I, this photo is, is is great because they're saying, well, how much percentage of It's like, well, they chuck a couple of buckets in, so it's not exactly a measured science. Two buckets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But co-fermentation is the critical piece of the puzzle here, um, and that's that's what gives it that texture. But yeah, that's a that's a yeah. It's a hell of a wine, and I think you know we're really this is this not that you know things are a competition, but we're really the conversation is is this. The, the greatest or one of the, the greatest Syrah wines from outside of Europe, outside of France, you know, this I, is kind I, of what we're, and we're talking I would, about. I would put it in, in the, the, if you're looking at the top two or three great red wines in Australia, never mind Shiraz, this is one of them, in my humble opinion. It doesn't matter what the heck it's made Absolutely. from. I think it's one of the great wines. And I think it's interesting, you make it, it's a comment that might be a little off topic here, but I think it's important in understanding, and this is my, because you know I'm sort of slowly but surely trying to pull together this book I'm writing on Australia, and the reality for me is I'm trying to understand why Australian wines are so damn good right now. And I don't say that because I do this for a job. I say that as a wine professional because Australia's never been more exciting. It's always been interesting and exciting, but I feel like we've gone through these different stages, and I might have mentioned this in the white wine thing, so forgive me for repeating it, but the Rome comparison and stuff, there was no question that Tim Kirk took his inspiration from the Rome, but I think it's inspiration versus mimicry. I think there's a difference between those two things. And I think we're at a point now where we've been through making wine and then, oh, wow, well, we're gonna make fine wine. And we're gonna make it like they do in Europe because all our varieties come from Europe. And let's make it sort of, I'm making a Burgundian Pinot or I'm making a Rhone style Shiraz. We've gone through that stage. And I think we're at a point now where it's less about, yeah, I'm not making a Rhone style Shiraz, even though sometimes people say that. I'm making Shiraz from my site here, and this is the very best expression. I think there's a confidence that's not about um, imitation. It's just about sort of inspiration from other places as opposed to trying to, do, and I think that shows through, that confidence shows through in the wines. And I, I think um, this is not trying to be Rhone, even though that's where his inspiration. This is absolutely the best expression of Shiraz grown in this area with that augmentation of, um, of uh, a little Viena. And I think it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately, you, you have to have confidence in your terroir. I mean, you, have to, you shouldn't yeah, be planting, yeah. planting vines and setting up a winery if you don't believe your, your place is capable of making great wine. Um, no. But talking of that, we should move on to the last wine, but yeah. final question, Canberra, are, are there any other wineries in Canberra? Because if there, oh, yeah. if there are, I don't know them. <laughs> I took, I, I took a, a, a trip down to the, on my own, this is not work related, and I just decided, I said to Tim, hey, listen, you mind if I come and visit? And he was busy doing stuff and he managed to take, he said, I've got kids and this, and it took like three hours out of his day and spent time with me. And then I went to visit Helm, which is a delicious Riesling producer and with like mm. arguably one of the most batshit crazy guys I've met and I love him, Ken Helm. Um, but there are other really good producers there. Um, his assistant winemaker at Clonakilla is making some really cool stuff at a place called Ravensworth. That's his line of wines, a little bit more natty and, and kind of, you know, on, on the edge. No, there's some brilliant producers in in uh, Clonakilla, in, in Canberra District, but Clonakilla has been this sort of beacon that everyone sort of, you know, 
you know, um, reaches out, reaches towards and, and sort of, you know, views as being the, the, the benchmark. But yeah, there's some cool stuff going on there, some really cool stuff. Fantastic. Okay, talking about benchmarks, we should, of course, finish with uh, an all-time Australian classic, um, which is uh, Barossa. Barossa. Cool. Kaleski, I'm a real fan. I haven't, not it was not a producer I was as familiar with, but I think it's nice in, in, on a, in a couple of ways. This is the winemaker is Troy Kaleski, seventh generation. So let's just remind ourselves with a name like Kaleski, that Germanic sound, that's the, the history and heritage of Barossa. There's, and it's unlike well, um, Adelaide Hills a little bit, but in terms of wine, there's no other wine region in Australia that's wine like so inextricably connected to with you know to this German heritage. Um, and and I Valley. Kind of, and say it again. Valley. Clare Valley Eden and Eden Valley. Valley. Clare Valley and Eden Valley. Clare's still a bit more on the British side of things, but Eden Valley is is definitely um is definitely there. But but I think it's kind of cool to 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 look at this because that that whole um I think Barossa, as I mentioned earlier, is um it got tarred with a brush, and I think there's all sorts of um really cool stuff happening in Barossa. Like 10 or 15 years ago, uh, there were a lot of clunky, heavy wines, syrupy wines, and and you know, to be honest, it wouldn't have been a region that I would have reached for first. I still like that style from time to time. I still drink it, but it's not my favorite style. It's less, it's like that's still part of the sort of tapestry of uh, Barossa styles. But now what we're getting is people being a bit more thoughtful about where they're growing, how they're growing, what they're doing, um, how they're blending and, and playing around with different things. And um, I think that's really exciting. And there's about this sort of picking at the right time as opposed to getting some of that raisinated what we would call dead fruit kind of quality into the wines and that existed in you know I remember tasting old California zins that were a bit like that but I feel like Koleski's are right on the pointy end of the stick in terms of being sort of one foot is traditional because they've had this these vineyards since the late 1800s in their family this particular mop is on the other side of, of um uh, in near Greenock it's at about a thousand feet above sea level so it's not just heavy, heavy duty kind of, kind of warm climate there. It's a little bit cooler, and it gets it benefits for some downdrafts and and cooling uh, evening uh, evening breezes. And I think that's helps with a bit of precision. Plus, there's 11% Petit Verdot and a little bit of Viognier in this as well, which is interesting to play around with a variety. And you think of that and you go, okay, if you've got overripe richness and what have you, and you think Petit Verdot, what do we know about that variety? It's late ripening. And so that's probably one of the things it's giving us an unusual blend for sure. But I like that this is a bit of forward thinking going, okay, we need more precision in our wines and we need more vibrant qualities in our wines. And I think that's starting to show through. So let's have a look at this. Yes. And I mean, look, it's, this is a, is this probably the warmest uh, vineyard location, uh, warmest region that we've looked at today? Or would you say that uh, McLaren Vale is right up there as well? This particular wine, isn't the warmest, but I think Barossa overall is a bit warmer than McLaren Vale, and it's slightly different. They're both they're both warm climate regions, but I think that overall Barossa is probably a little bit warmer. That's different diurnal. Depends where you are. Obviously, the diurnal difference in Eden sure. Valley is quite quite dramatic. But I think what I love about this is, you know, you can't get away from Barossa being a warm climate region. That's what it is. But sure. that doesn't preclude the, the the great wines from Barossa having freshness and vibrant thing, and that's not expression I probably would have used about Barossa 15 years ago. Right? I like yeah. that now because you see that in this particular wine and you can't get away from the power and the intensity, nor should you. Mother Nature's delivering this warmth. It's about taming that and, and managing it and not just letting it all get sort of sort of blown out. Um, and 17 was good vintage as well. It was a, it had some long hang times there. It was, there were some nice cool stretches towards the end of the harvest. And I think I think this is a wonderful example of what I would call modern Barossa, but there's all sorts of markers in here that are anything but modern, you know, seventh generation winemaker, old vines. But do you, do you see what I mean? Did, I mean, I don't know if you're, you're getting that. There's a vibrant nature to the fruit here, to the core of the fruit here that I think is really, really charming. And warmth and richness that's comforting because that's what you've come to expect from Barossa at the same time. Yeah, and look, you know, I go back to what I was saying earlier about thinking about how wine is constructed, how it's put together, how it works, what's its internal logic. And here, of course, you've got the generosity and the richness and the suppleness of that of that Shiraz fruit. But on the other hand, you've got a dry, savory finish. You've got the spiciness from the Petit Verdot. Uh, and also the Petit Verdot is so rich in tannins that they themselves taste a bit dry as well. They're their tannins, that's what they do. And so that also provides this contrast between between that and the fruit. So it's actually quite harmonious whole. Yeah, 
it's really I'm really impressed with this and this is the kind of Barossa wine I love right now I'm glad I, I selected this particular wine it doesn't have this vintage but yeah yeah it's so true on that spice that's coming through from that's only what 11 percent of it but uh, you think about that it's like yeah oh classic Barossa a little bit of Petit Verdot or how about no that's not particularly classic but how about a little bit of forward thinking and going well hang on a second this is in, you know it's 86 percent Shiraz this is effectively a Barossa you know it's a Barossa Shiraz Barossa Valley Shiraz but what are we going to do? What are, how are we going to, you know, keep the interest and in the sort of the 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 vibrancy alive? And I think you're right. There's that there's a little tannic whiff, sort of almost whiff at the back uh, the back end here. But it it's certainly it's keeping this wine really precise and really charming. And it's just texturally really beautiful without being heavy. Yeah, and yet I bet you the yeah. it's not like super alcoholic. But I mean I bet you it's fourteen. Yeah, it says fourteen five. Um, it's every bit of that, but not heavy at all. No. No, I agree, uh, and I do think, um, as I often I often mention in my educational sessions, I think that if people want to know what a great texture in a wine is, then Barossa Shiraz is a great is a great place to go because it's so seamless. There's not one little fold; it's just a great wave of, of fruit. Yeah, but you're right about that savory at the end there too. That's really cool. Yeah, that's um, wow, awesome. I'm happy. The wine's behaved. No, they were beautiful today, really, um, and great producers as well. So, um, Mark, to sum up, um, if people want to learn more, the Wine Australia website is the place to go. Um, uh, I know that, you know, all the sort of generic bodies of all different countries and wine producing regions put a lot of work into this kind of uh, promotional material on websites. But I do think, and I say this <laughs> without bias, but I do think Wine Australia is, is a great resource. So. I do encourage students to take a look at that. Thank Anything you. you'd like to add before we go, Mark? No, I think I think you know it, it depends. I mean, I think these sessions that you've done and the, the these two I've done with you have been fun in the sense that it's been great to sort of you know it's hard without being in the room and tasting the wines, but yeah. it's kind of nice to go sort of go through go through these and say here's the the key things to look for. And but I think the I think what's happening right now in Australia and I think what you know stereotypes exist everywhere we all have them in our minds about everywhere i mean and 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 that's part of our job as wine professionals is to to constantly be tasting and constantly have an open mind and constantly i mean if i so i stopped and thought what i thought about when i first tried i don't know portuguese the duro dry duro wines in the late 80s it's totally different now and that's you know there's right. been a big evolution there's been a big change and then you know what what was going on with greek wines 20 years ago is not at all what's happening and so the same thing here there's been a lovely evolution and i think um what I think we saw in all of these wines, lovely roller coaster ride, ride of, of, of styles and character and quality, but that the the texture and I think that there's a vibrant quality that exists in in everything here. And and like I said, when was the last time you thought Barossa fresh and vibrant? <laughs> like, well, there's a sort of almost a bit of an anomaly, but uh, but I, I like that and I yeah. think that that's existed through all these. And I think there's a lovely definition and and and, and expression in uh, in all these wines today. It was fun, it was fun to taste. Look at Fantastic. us, what a well, lovely not, life we have. I, you know, <laughs> I thank you so much though, but seriously for uh, taking the time and also for Wine, Wine Australia's uh, support and supplying the wine. So thank you. And I hope that all of you who are watching this has been uh, interesting and valuable for you. And that when we get awesome. back to normal, you can travel to Australia and see these great uh, vineyard sites for yourself. Exactly. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. You too. Take care.